Breaking news. Was alcohol a driver for the development of complex societies? A big data study from around the world looks at the causal relationship between alcohol and human civilization. Is the drunk hypothesis correct? Yeah, probably. Uh, we found the support for it. All right, everybody, we are back to old news with Flint Dibble. So for the next story, I had to open up my beer because we are going to dive into, we are going to dive into, we're going to sift some more of this archaeology news. We're going to find ourselves a little nugget, a little fun one, aren't we? The question we're hoping to answer is, was alcohol a contributing factor to the rise of complex societies? Do we owe everything, all the civilization and technology that's around us, to beer? Could that really be the case? I sat down with the lead author of the study, Did Alcohol Facilitate the Evolution of Complex Societies, Vaclav Hernscher. Um, from the Max Planck Institute of Human Evolution in Leipzig to ask him what he thought and what the conclusions from his study showed. Here we go. So, okay, do you want to just uh, tell us first what the drunk hypothesis is? Okay, so drunk hypothesis is labeled according to the book uh, by Edward Slingerland called Drunk. And it kinda, it's a hypothesis uh, about that intoxication helps promote building of large scale uh, complex societies because it promotes you know, uh, human creativity, uh, social bonding, and also trust and mostly cooperation. Yeah, I think that makes sense. And I think it's uh, funny that his name is Slingerland because he must like to sling one back. <laughs> so you just did a large scale study of this. Do you want to explain what you what you actually did in your paper? Yeah, yeah. we tried to test it using ethnographic data, uh, like from 186 societies around the world, ranging from egalitarian hunter-gatherers to uh, clan-based pastoralists to you know, state agriculturists. And we try to find whether there is a link between you know, uh, presence of fermented beverages and the higher levels of you know, complexity or large-scale societies. Okay, and so this is from all over the world, and it's ethnographic, so that means that it's more modern yeah. data rather than yeah, yeah, archaeological yeah, actually, data? Yeah, it's, it's mostly the modern data from 19th or early 20th century, so okay. we didn't study like, the ancient societies. Okay, that's interesting. Um, so what were your findings then? Is, is the drunk hypothesis correct? Yeah, probably. Uh, we cannot like prove it, but we found the support for it because we found a relatively like modest correlation between alcohol and uh, higher levels of political complexity. Actually, we run several models and uh, in a simple model where we have only like alcohol and political complexity, the correlation was relatively strong, but we started to control for other factors, you know, like shared ancestry or environmental productivity or agriculture. Uh, the, the effect was uh, kind of smaller, but I think it's still a present. Okay, that makes sense. So uh, a few quick questions. How do you define social complexity here? I mean, that's a tricky topic, right? Yeah, yeah it's very, very difficult to measure it. So we used a proxy uh, called kind of political complexity, which measures the number of administrative levels in each society. So basically, if, if you imagine like the modern day um, nation, you have like the uh, the rulers at the level of a city, then at the level of a county, and at the level of whole like kind of kind of state or or country. So we counted how many uh, each level is, is in each society. So essentially, bureaucracy means complexity. <laughs> yeah, 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 basically, it's it's a proxy because it's relatively easy to to measure it compared to, for example, you know, uh, the, the size of population, which is, you know, really tricky to, to measure, so. Yeah, so essentially the longer you have to wait at the DMV, the more complex your society is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
<laughs> so, okay. So uh, alcohol is obviously one factor and your conclusion is that it actually is a factor. What other factors are there in emerging complexity in different societies? Yeah, definitely the, the presence of agriculture and the production you know, of food surpluses that you know, allows this like rise in population sizes and also the, the specialization of people, you know, they don't have to produce only food, but can you know, start to make crafts or, or trade and so on. And probably we, we haven't tested it, but you know, the arguments are that the religion played also uh, an important role. And Wait, oh, religion, the, okay, yeah. Yeah, yeah, religion and maybe also like the war warfare technologies that you know allow to expand the the, the societies, you know. Uh, yeah. So it isn't so simple as just people getting drunk and civilization no, no, occurs. There's a, it's it's part of a package of different yeah, variables yeah, 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 that impact yeah. things. That makes a lot of sense, I think. Um, yeah. it's, it sounds like you wrote this while sober. Um, <laughs> I hope. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, so anything else are you planning or do you think this can be applied to past societies as well? What are you thinking along that end? Yeah, yeah. Actually, we did this uh, study because it's difficult to study in like ancient societies. There has been like several studies that you know uh, shows that in you know, early civilizations like Mesopotamia, ancient Egypt, ancient Ch China, or or you know Incas Empire, the uh, alcohol played an important like religious, economic, and social roles. But you know, it's difficult to find you know. Uh, not that complex societies and whether they have uh, had alcohol or not. So because, you know, finding alcohol in archaeological record is really like difficult and you can find it mostly in like this, in societies with pottery or. Yeah, so. that's definitely very true. All right. Well, thank you so much. Do you have any last thoughts you want to share? Oh, uh, no, not not. Bottoms <laughs> up, I guess. <laughs> well, thank you um, yeah. for your time. So I thought really quickly, just to give an example of an early, the one of the earliest examples of beer um, or possible beer um, from the archaeological record is actually from Gobekli Tepe. And so I took a clip from an interview I did with Jens Nothrof. I'll put the link in the chat in a second um, where he describes this uh, early, early beer. Interestingly, some of these large stone vessels had a grayish appearance in, in the interior, and we, of course, we sampled it. And there was some hint at oxalat having built up uh, in these vessels, which uh, typically develops uh, during fermentation of cereals, for example. It also develops uh, with other plants, uh, rhabarb is one, I think, and spinach as well. But given the whole context of, uh, of plant processing with einkorn and so on, it seems at least plausible to argue that um, there was some kind of fermentation of cereals going on in these in these vessels, which could happen naturally if you just uh, forget your gruel or porridge uh, a day too long in the sun and then something uh, just happens. Or it just might hint at a very intentional process of early beer brewing. We recreated this experimentally. It's possible even without adding yeast or hops or something. So the result is a very refreshing, but with very low alcohol, a very kind of refreshing beer-like drink, a very low alcohol, which is a, a very variety of, of reasons. It's it's an improvement over water. It tastes better, for, for, for example, but it's also more durable uh, uh, to, to be stored up there in water. And it uh, quite interesting something I read just read up uh, on is that the fermentation process also somehow degrades the uh, proteins in, in the cereal. Celiac disease. Okay, so yeah, it helps people be able yeah. to consume grain. And this is something uh, which the fermentation process uh, actually uh, speeds up the degradation of uh, of these proteins already. Okay, this or... is interesting. What I'm hearing from you is that you don't think Gobekli Tepe is a mystery. <laughs> no. So there we go. We have this sort of drunk hypothesis and whether alcohol facilitated the evolution of complex societies. And as we've seen, this is not a new hypothesis per se. It's something that's been kicking around. But in this study, it's the first really kind of big data approach where they use this database of 186 modern ethnographic uh, non-industrial societies 
to look about how complex their societies were in terms of political complexity. Um, so, you know, whether they have DMVs or not, as we described in the video, uh, and, and the presence of alcohol specifically, not other types of intoxicants, specifically alcohol in and of itself. And so, you know, as the example from Gobekli Tepe shows, hunter-gatherers could produce alcohol. The people at Gobekli Tepe, that was hunter-gatherers there, though they were at the site at least half the year or so. So there was time for fermentation to occur. Um, so the conclusion here is their results. So they tested the hypothesis with a global sample of 186 largely non-industrial societies, a purpose-built data set on intoxicants and causal inference methods. And they find a positive relationship between the presence of indigenous alcohol beverages and higher levels of political complexity measured by the number of administrative levels. Their results support the idea that the group level social benefits of traditional non-distilled fermented beverages may outweigh their disruptive effects and that alcohol possibly facilitated the evolution of human societies. However, other contributing factors such as agriculture or religion were probably more effective drivers than getting drunk. So let's dive in just really briefly into some of the details here. Um, so this is the kind of model that they came up with for the different possible factors that could relate to um, socio-political complexity, um, things like alcohol, but also especially agriculture, food surplus. And you you don't necessarily need agriculture to develop alcohol, but it's obviously most common. Um, food surplus, uh, large animals, which all of these could lead to things like being sedentary, social stratification, and, and different kinds of religion, big gods, as they call it and then uh, develop different kinds of technology, which can then also feed into this kind of feedback loop through which sociopolitical complexity develops and manifests itself, of course. Um, and in their conclusion, they say that taking together the cross-cultural data provides empirical support for this drunk hypothesis. In all the models tested, so they tested a variety, five different models with different variables that they were looking at, they did find a positive relationship between the presence of local indigenous alcoholic beverages and the level of political complexity. What they mean by indigenous here, by the way, is not indigenous peoples. It means that Alcoholic beverages were developed locally. They weren't like an imported kind of alcohol for the uh, a tradition that was imported from somewhere else. Um, so, you know, beer being imported by, by or, or wine by the Europeans, that kind of thing. Um, and so uh, it, it should be emphasized, though, that while this relationship is present in all five of them, it is rather weak in the last two models, which include agriculture, possibly suggesting that agriculture is the more important variable rather than alcohol in the development of socio-political complexity. Um, so they argue that from a global perspective, alcohol production is a consequence or byproduct of agriculture rather than a cause of it. Although we do not exclude the possibility that in certain cases the opposite may have been true. Um, as we know, after all, Gobekli Tepe was not agricultural, but it, it probably had alcohol of some sort of type of beer. So uh, so in this sense, there's still a lot of room here. This was based off of mostly modern studies. When we start throwing in archaeological studies, we see additional nuance and additional complexity to it. That said, there is still a really interesting and intriguing relationship between alcohol and civilization and sociopolitical complexity. Hmm. I feel more complex as an individual already. It has a deep, rich taste. This is a Cornish beer, by the way. It's Doom Bar. I am not being paid to advertise it. I just enjoy drinking it. And uh, each sip makes me feel more complex in a sociopolitical sort of way. Don't you? Can you not hear it in the tenor of my voice? I have become more complex. Yes, and now I am even more complex as an individual. Moving on. <laughs> so the other key thing to note is the two different sides of alcohol, after all. Anthropologists have long pointed out that alcohol is a bonding function. It's that social lubricant, after all. And it's an active force through which personal and group identities are constructed and built, transformed and embodied. Moreover, it's argued that power, alcohol is a powerful political tool that played a significant role in the formation of early states such as Mesopotamia, Egypt, China, and the Andes. 
Alcoholic beverages are not just ordinary food consumed only for sustenance. They are valuable primarily for their intoxicating and effective power, their ability to transform and manipulate people, places, and events. Anybody that has been to a party where alcohol is being consumed, even if you do not consume alcohol, can recognize the power of alcohol in building community and fostering conversations and connections between different people. So that's something that we can all see in our day-to-day -day lives, and it's something that we can therefore think about how it applies to these past societies. On the other hand, not every glass is half full. Alcohol certainly has these positives. It facilitates social interactions and strengthens group cohesion, but it also fosters interpersonal antagonism and rivalry. Drunken fights, let's go. I've had too much to drink. It's time to go. I'm going to punch somebody in the chat. Boom, 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 boom. There you go. The trolls are defeated. Trolls are defeated. If you're going to troll me, I'm going to take you on, trolls. I'm going to take you on. Yeah. No, but the point is, is that we have plentiful examples of alcohol really having problems and causing kinds of cultural um, issues and, and individual issues and social issues with people that consume too much and they get violent or they get angry or relationships break down due to alcohol. Anybody that has been to a party where too much alcohol is consumed, even if you don't drink, has probably seen this happen as well. It is unfortunately a common side effect of alcohol. All right, that last sip made me less violent. The trolls, you can stay. It's cool. We're friends again. We're friends again, trolls. I've had another drink. I'm a happy drunk now. Woohoo! All right. Um, now, just for some good archaeological evidence from some of my own research, um, this is an Athenian red figure pot showing a member of the symposium in Athens who has had too much to drink, and this enslaved person is helping him vomit into the bucket. Um, so yeah, this is an example of the bad sides. On the other hand, Herodotus, the very first historian, for example, describes the Persians and how they drink. And they, he mentions that it is their custom to deliberate about the most important matters, the gravest matters, when they are drunk. And, when they, and what they approve in their drunken deliberations is proposed to them again the next day when they are sober. And if being sober, they still approve it, then they act on it. But if not, they drop the idea. But if they deliberated about a matter first when sober, they then decide if it's a good idea when drunk. And so this is something I think that's kind of interesting is when something's a good idea in different contexts, when you're sober and you're drunk or whatever, when you're happy and you're sad or when you're, when you're shooting the shit with your friends versus talking to your boss, if these are good ideas in multiple contexts, that usually means you've thought it through in different ways. And therefore, it is a good idea. And so the Persians solved this problem by deliberating all of their most important decisions while both drunk and then sober or vice versa. And if it was a good, they only acted on it if it was a good idea in both contexts, which, of course, you could argue maybe is what made the Persian Empire so successful for so many hundreds of years because they thought things through carefully and while drunk. <laughs> <laughs> so there we go. This is the uh, contributions of alcohol to civilization. It was a pleasure. Please make sure to leave a comment afterwards in order to boost the algorithm machine. Make sure to give it a like. Make sure to give it a share. I want to thank everybody for showing up and try to show up in person when you can because that makes a big difference. Um, I really do appreciate everybody who's here. Uh, love and archaeology to all. Breaking news, scholars have published the first ever archaeological survey of a comet. The results of this cosmic archaeology will surprise you. Stay tuned. A large genetic study has revealed the very first dogs to be introduced to South America. Let's look into the who, what, where, and why. Was alcohol a driver for the development of complex societies? A big data study from around the world looks at the causal relationship between alcohol and human civilization. Is the drunk hypothesis correct? Yeah, probably. Uh, we found the support for it. All this and more on Old News with Flint Dibble. I'm Flint Dibble, and I'll see you Sunday.